where he preached on it at, at some point in time. And I've got a little note that he said that even a fish can't stand a bad preacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> good morning, Bill. He muted himself. John Paul is uh, from India. Oh, uh, from Susan. Wow. Good morning, John Paul. He's a pastor from India, and we're delighted to have you. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you join us today. I'm sorry you're getting on in on the end of this, but uh, we'll we'll do uh, another uh, Tony. Uh, so, uh, another New Testament book in uh, in a few in a few weeks, and I'll send you an invitation at that time too. But we're delighted that you uh, joined us. Now, how did you manage to find that video? Uh, actually, uh, I was uh, 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 there to preach in Jonah. I was searching uh, some YouTube videos okay. for some deep. Uh, understanding so i was found your video it was very useful for me to preach in church and uh, it, it it is uh, many things was new for me uh, what you are uh, preached thank you so much <laughs> well we're delighted to have you and uh, i'm gonna send uh an important thing about here is, is community and we got people from a number of different places in the united states and uh, so uh, we're delighted to have you. Now it's close to bedtime at your place, isn't it? Yeah, actually now it's uh, uh, nine nine p.m. in India. <laughs> yeah. Time to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Susan and Tony. Good morning. morning. How y'all doing? Doing great. Good. Could, yeah, last could I... uh, go ahead. Could I offer John Paul some information from my church, uh, Sherwood Baptist Church in Albany? Um, there's, they're on the uh, website, and you can um, pull up, and they have sermons. Uh, our, our pastor now is awesome, Paul Goddard. But um, on, on the website, they have um, uh, information and sermons from Ron Dunn, which was our previous pastor's mentor, Warren Wearsby, um, um, several, several more, but there's a lot of videos and sermons and information and just all kind of stuff that um, might might help you or assist you. And it's a Southern Baptist Church. Um, I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but, um, but that's, um, but it's Sherwood um, Baptist Church in Albany, Georgia. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. I will, I will follow. Actually, uh, it's very, thank, very much uh, happy because uh, uh, from my childhood I used to uh, search for good uh, Bible studies in a uh, lot of places. But in in India, uh, we will get uh, not much like uh, you you are getting. So uh, thank you so much because the Word of God is powerful, and when we meditated, we, we will found the new new things and new new revelation revelations. It will it will lead our life in our ministry also. We have a church, and it will be useful for our, our congregation also. We are doing ministry in uh, uh, South India in uh, a village. Uh, so now only I started my ministry, it is growing. So uh, when, whenever I preach, I used to uh, uh, see and I used to watch a lot of videos. So what we can get uh, something new uh, so that... Uh, deep, you can go deep understanding and deep knowledge to uh, meditate the word of God. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, John Paul, who is from India, he has a great testimony, and, and we'll get him to share that later sometime. He comes from, a, uh, his dad is a pastor as well, and comes from a Hindu background, and we're delighted uh, he's a part of the Christian faith and community with us today. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pray and then we'll uh, get things set up to get going. Father, how grateful we are that we have this opportunity to uh, engage in the study of your word. 
for the book of Johnny that reveals so much about you and so much about ourselves. We are grateful. We're thankful for each person who is here today. Particularly, we welcome uh, John Paul and pray, Father, that you would uh, continue to use him as he shares the Christian message in his homeland. Now, bless us as we proceed. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. Today we will, I guess, tie the ribbon around the book of Jonah and uh, complete it. Uh, it's been a fascinating study for me to once again engage in this Old Testament prophet whose name means dove, but his behavior is quite contrary to uh, the meaning of his name. Uh, I will explain as we go through my reasons for giving the outline that I have to uh, Jonah, because we're going to review each chapter briefly. I call this particular chapter Languishing in Nineveh because uh, Jonah is there. He has delivered the message. The people have repented, and Jonah takes a hike outside and finds a, a very comfortable place on the side of the hill where he can watch and see what God does to the land uh, that he came to, to Nineveh. He, I believe, was hoping that God would uh, destroy those people, which uh, helps uh, us. This book helps me to see how I need God more every day. Uh <clears throat> In the first chapter, uh, we find that uh, Jonah was uh, fleeing from God. I call it looking for Tarshish because I think uh, he was looking for a place to hide just as Adam and Eve attempted to hide from God. And many other stories in the Bible uh, seem to uh, have people trying to either flee from the call of God or to hide from him. In chapter 1, God commands Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against the wickedness of that city. And it, to describe the wickedness of that city is beyond, almost beyond description. Uh, Jonah boards a ship heading in the opposite direction, uh, fleeing from God's command uh, rather than going the 550 miles to Nineveh, he takes a hiatus 2,500 miles off the uh, coast of Spain uh, in that region, attempting to get as far east, uh, excuse me, as far west as he could away from God rather than going to his mission. While in, on that boat, uh, ship, a storm arises on the ship, the sailors uh, see that Jonah is disobedient and throw him overboard. They seem to have more faith in God than Jonah. And then, of course, God prepares uh, that fish just like he prepares the, uh, in, the, in the chapter today, both the gourd and the worm. God prepared, prepared this great fish. So we f find him running. Then we find him uh, longing, and this is my reason for using this uh, designation, longing for home. To me, I liken him to like the, uh, to the prodigal son who found himself away from God, away from home, and uh, uh, sought to get back to those things that were familiar to him. And Jonah prays to God from the belly of the fish, acknowledging his disobedience and seeking forgiveness. Now, apparently, God took this to be a repentant heart, 
but it doesn't seem that Jonah really meant uh, what he uh, is saying. Jonah expresses his trust in God's deliverance. God commands the fish to as uh, to vomit Jonah out onto dry ground, and as Belinda already shared with us, that even uh, a fish couldn't stand a bad preacher. I like that, and I'll use it uh, from now on, Belinda. And then we find the uh, chapter that we studied, studied last week, where God commands Jonah a second time to go to Nineveh and preach against it. And each of us, I think, are grateful for the second opportunities that God gives us. Uh, and so Jonah is called that second time. He obeys and preaches to the people of Nineveh uh, a message in Hebrew that's only five words when he said 40 days. And of course, 40 days is used throughout scripture as a number indicating sufficiency sufficient amount of time warning them of the impending destruction 40 days and god is going to overthrow your city again we mentioned the fact that there was no mention of god no mention of a uh, of their sin or whatever uh, any pastor, and I'm sure John Paul would agree, any pastor would like to have that kind of response uh, from people who uh, we preach to. Often we have, uh, too often people walk away without doing anything. And then number three, the people of Nineveh repent and return to God, fasting and wearing sackcloth, of course, indicating their repentant nature. God sees their repentance and does what we know to be relents rather than repents from destroying the city. He makes it softer, makes the changes. And today we're going to look at the um, ways that uh, Jonah becomes angry and bitter because God shows mercy to Nineveh. You recall perhaps that I said that for me, uh, Jonah says it's mercy for me, but justice for you or judgment on you. And uh, we have to agree that God showed mercy to uh, Jonah and he was calling upon Jonah to preach a message of mercy to the Ninevites, but Jonah really hated the Ninevites, did not want them to have the mercy of God. Then Jonah, as I said earlier, goes outside the sea, sits in the shade, waiting to see what will happen to Nineveh. God will provide a plant to shade Jonah from the sun, which Jonah appreciates. God sends a worm to destroy the plant, causing Jonah discomfort. And God uses this situation to teach Jonah about his mercy and compassion for all people, including the people of Nineveh. But I would have to say that that message is the same for us as well. Now, uh, Jonah was angry uh, when uh, he saw what uh, God was uh, was going to do. And, and let me make a, one little correction. Okay. Uh, but Jonah, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. But it's not about Jonah. It's about God's message that Jonah was to live to deliver. Uh, unfortunately, we are sometimes so narcissistic that we think it's all about us. But Jonah was like the mailman who uh, is called upon not to uh, 
go through the mail and decide what is good and what is bad, but simply to deliver it. So Jonah was taking it upon himself, and he uh, uh, said, this just is right. It's because of John's, uh, Jonah's nature that this is revealed. Then he became very angry. Then he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still home? This is what I tried to, this is what I, uh, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. He said, I tried to stop it. Uh, I knew what you would do. And he reveals, I tried to stop this because I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. And one who re, uh, 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 re relents from sending calamity. I'm not sure how I made the error on the, that particular one, but I'll correct it before I send this out. But uh, that you relents lent from uh, sending the calamity. So he said, I tried to stop this. I wanted uh, the people of Nineveh to, Nineveh to go down rather than to be saved. Now, uh, Nineveh, I mean, Jonah, was so hard-headed, so bitter, that he was uh, like, uh, when we don't get our way sometimes, he says, now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. That's uh, how, uh, I guess, entrenched and bitter Jonah was. But the Lord asked him a question. Is it right for you to be angry? I think this is a time perhaps when we should note the sovereignty of God, that God is in charge and God uh, has a heart for the whole world. And I'll uh, have a, a, a later on, we'll share what I think is revealed in the book of Jonah. And so he's, and that's the saying, Jonah, it's not your call, it's my call. Now, there are many uh, characters in the Bible who were at the same state of Jonah when it came to uh, feeling, uh, you know, that uh, they were at the end of their rope. My mother-in-law uh, did me a small um uh, stitching of a statement that said it had a frog and it had a rope and it said when you are at the end of the rope tie a knot and hang on well at nine o'clock last night a friend in the hospital called me and said I am so depressed and of course I sent a note back to him that I was praying for him, but also I included this passage because it was at the end of the rope that Elijah was overwhelmed and was despairing, and God fed him. He took nur uh, nurture. God allowed him to sleep. As a result, Elijah overcame that sense of depression, and that's probably as good a a description of depression that you'll find in the Bible is what happened in the life of Elijah. But also this passage that we have, Jonah was at the end of his rope, but then there's Job in his extreme suffering, cursed the day of his birth and expressed a longing for death. And you can read uh, that from the book of Job and be reminded that uh, things come that are difficult for a lot of people. Jeremiah lamented and even cursed the day that he was born because of what he endured. 
And so did Moses uh, in the heat of the battle. Moses uh, expressed an ex a, a burden of the ex exasperation with the burden of leadership and the complaints of the people. You remember, remember that was at the time when he uh, divided the people up and uh, appointed people uh, to help. So he took on some help. Paul even uh, ran into the issues that said in, in Philippians, I am torn between the two. I desire to, to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So he, there's those conflicts. Jonah's anger then continues. Jonah had gone out, sat down at a place east of the city. There he made a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. I can't imagine what was on Jonah's mind at that time. Surely he didn't think that God was not going to act out of his uh, promise to uh, save them if they really repented of their sins. But nonetheless, that was what Jonah did. Uh, there, as he sat in the shade, God then provided, then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about that. Just like God prepared the fish to save Jonah from the depths of the sea, God prepared this shade for Jonah in the midst of uh, that hot sun. And Jonah was happy when God showed his mercy toward him. And uh, I think this reveals basically human nature. When it's going my way and things are happening well for me, uh, then that's okay. Someone said we sh it's easier to share someone's sorrow than it is to share someone's uh, benefit or someone's joy. Uh, we live in a day of, of uh, communication with TikTok and with Facebook where people uh, have a very uh, thwarted view about comparing oneself to someone else. Therefore, there's a lot of unhappiness over the joys that come to others. And so Jonah was happy as long as mercy was extended to him. The seventh verse, but at dawn, the day, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. Now, those of you who are uh, in gardening, like Bill, my brother, who is on, uh, those are the, the things that you have to worry about that invade your crops. But nonetheless, God sent that worm. That worm was sent to teach Jonah a lesson. And whenever the worm cut through the plant, the plant withered. It's so easy for us to forget how God has set up nature in such a wonderful way. But Jonah's anger continued. Uh, when the sun rose, God provided a scorching wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and it would be better for me to die than live, Jonah continues. Verse 9, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He said, it is. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Now, had it been me at that particular time, I would have zapped him and said, go ahead. It's better for me and you that you be dead. But God continued with his patience and uh, he continued to uh, 
show uh, mercy and kindness uh, unlike that which um, Jonah had uh, shown toward the Ninevites. But verse 10 says, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about the plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. You you had nothing to do with that plant. And he said, and I, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and so many ain't animals. Now, uh, the reference to the 120,000 people uh, has been uh, by scholars concluded that that's referencing children and likely uh, you combine that with the parents that you're talking about over 600,000. I'm afraid that I said that uh, said in this meeting earlier, maybe last week, and referred to it uh, over a million, but it's really uh, 600,000. And that's a strange ending. And he said, and so many animals. I like to listen to a lot of different scholars and uh, people in conversation. And there are some philosophers today who, who uh, elevate animals to the same level of human beings. Uh, a man by the name of Peter Singer, an uh, uh, atheist, but also a uh, debater, elevates animals to the same level as human beings. Of course, uh, John Lennox, uh, a great debater, says he always, always begins his arguments uh, in those debates as he believes that man is made in the image of God. Therefore, there's a separation of man and animals. But all this is a strange ending, and I want to make some comments here that I think maybe will help us to understand. Uh, here, I want to show some of the uh, lessons that come from the book of Jonah. It shows first God's mercy and compassion. That's the central message that God is merciful, merciful and compassion, uh, even uh, willing to be merciful and compassionate, even though Jonah did not share that same attitude. But also it points out the importance of obedience. Jonah attempted to run from God, disobedient. Uh, he still was disobedient in terms of his attitude, but once uh, he set out to do uh, the mission God called him to do, uh, his life was better. So the lesson is it is very important that we are obedient to God. Also, it shows God's sovereign nature. Behind this whole thing, it was God that was behind the wind. It was God behind who was behind the great fish. It was God that uh, uh, sent the worm and the gourd and the wind. Uh, he is sovereign, and the sovereignty of God is beyond anything that we are, are able to understand. But also, God wants to reach people of all nations around the world. Uh, he wants to re reach the Ninevites, the enemy of Jonah, and sometimes we're called upon to do the hard task of going even to our enemies. He also teaches in this book uh, repentance and forgiveness. Uh, the people of Nineveh responded to Jonah's message, demonstrating power, the power of repentance. And he emphasizes that importance, the important thing. 
But also, he also points out human responsibility in God's plan. Despite God's sovereignty, Jonah's choices and actions still play a significant role in the unfolding of these events. The, this highlights the tension between divine sovereignty and human responsibility within God's overreaching plan. Overall, the book of Jonah teaches us about the importance of obedience, the universality of his message, the power of repentance and forgiveness. For me, I have boiled it down to these concepts. The book of Jonah reveals the nature of God expressed in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one and he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I believe that is revealed in the book of Jonah, but also in the life of Jonah, I think that it reveals the nature of man. We are fallen, left to ourselves. We are sinful, and uh, as expressed in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For me, now I want to hear perhaps uh, from you the, some of your conclusions, but that is the two main things that are revealed that is the nature of God and the nature of man uh, in this book. Uh, if you are familiar with Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, who went to South America as missionaries uh, and uh, the Gates of Splendor is a movie made about their lives going to uh, an Indian tribe that had never been told the gospel message. They went there, and there's a long story of how they little by little gained the confidence of this Indian tribe by different kinds of uh, movement of the plane, and they won their uh, favor. But Jim Elliott, who is noted for having said he is no fool who gives up what he cannot lose to gain what he cannot, uh, to, gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is noted for having made that statement. Jim and two others went one day and landed their plane on what they thought to be a mission of mercy to this Indian tribe, but the Indian tribe, uh, because of their lack of uh, knowledge of the gospel and also what the message they were bringing, they turned on the Elliot, Jim Elliot and his crew, and they all died uh, at the hands of the very people they went to serve and to tell the message. However, that is not the end of the story. Elizabeth Elliot took up where Jim Elliot left off and continued to work with this tribe uh, in, uh, in, in the region where they went. And uh, eventually, she was able to share the gospel and win this group to Christ. And it's a wonderful story of how she welcomed the very man who was the first to throw the spear that uh, took the life of her husband, Jim Elliott. I think that that reveals what God is saying in this story of Jonah, that we are called upon sometimes to go into the hard places and even into the heart of those who are perhaps our enemies 
to tell the story. And that's the message of God. His mercy and grace are wider than any of our mercy and grace. Therefore, that is our responsibility to go as Jonah was called upon at this time to go. James reminds us that we are like the hearer, uh, verse uh, of, of James uh, 1, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is a like, a man, like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Too often, we are like Jonah, and this story helps us to remember and be called to the task of adopting the mercy and grace of God, which is far beyond our understanding, but it is what God calls us to do, to go to all people to share the gospel, even if it requires us to go to our enemy. I'm going to stop my screen sharing right now and uh, uh, give you an opportunity to uh, maybe reflect and talk about uh, some of the things that you uh, have uh, learned in your own study and comments that you might want to make. So if you have a you, comment that you would you like. You need to unmute yourself. You'll have to, yeah. Anybody have a comment that you would like to make? Well, I'll continue studying these areas now in uh, a few weeks. I'll do a uh, the book, and I'll send out information about that. And if you want to join us, uh, and to all of you who have not met our the newest member is John Paul. Uh, John Paul, raise your hand and let everybody know that you are here. Raise your hand and say hello to everybody. Uh, we're, we're glad to have uh, John Paul who joined us in India today. He came the longest distance, but now he's, he's about ready to go to bed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're delighted, John Paul, that you to join us. And we'll look forward to you on us when we get started back uh, in weeks. Anybody got any comment? Yeah, actually, uh, thank you. Uh, what you said is uh, very uh, relevant to our context. Uh, uh, whenever we, we, we went for a preaching gospel, uh, many a times I feel uh, whenever the people who oppose and who came to beat us and who uh, told not to preach the gospel and who is against us and who stoned us, one day God has turned him to be a believer in our church. Many many of people we, are, we have seen that God has transformed their life. Many we can testify in our church also. Uh, one of the priests, Hindu priests, when when I was a child, child when I was a young boy, went for a steep preaching. Uh, one of the Hindu priests came and opposed us. When when we preached and we prayed, he is now he is our believer. God has changed his heart upside down. One he opposed, but now he is, he is taking the gospel to many many villages. Wonderful. So, what what God has a tremendous plan? He can change and he can transform whoever we can use and he can transform us. <laughs> Thank you. Great, John Paul. Thank you for that comment. 